Okay, thank you. And, and so we'll, for the summary, we'll go to uh, Dick Winchelbaum. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I, want to, I want to explain first how this group operated, because both Heidi and Laura supplied their slides early, violating most rules of academic slide making, and that gave the group an opportunity to interact with them, and they, ha they have changed the slides significantly from the beginning to address those topics which were basically on our list, that is genomic testing, actionability, validation, and, and lab reports. And I want to thank both of them and the entire group because I see one of my functions is being certain that the members of our group, that is uh, Murray, David, John, and Kim, have an opportunity to make their comments uh, with regard to these specific issues. What has come through from both of these presentations is that the Emerge PGX project uh, has certainly uh, forced us to deal with practical issues different at each site, and I'm sure that Ithikar Kuo and Chris Shute would say that uh, would uh, agree that at the Mayo Clinic this has been a major catalyst, and I want to be sure I say that very clearly, uh, to uh, addressing very practical issues of if implementation, not all of which some of us had, had thought through carefully, so that this has proved to be very important. I want to also go out of my way to say that that PGRN seq reagent was developed by the investigators of the PGRN, but that's the royal we. Uh, really, it was Debbie Nickerson, whom we heard from just before lunch, and Steve Scherer at Baylor, who I think, with their colleagues, uh, we need to thank for the fact that uh, Laura could say that that, has that that reagent has performed so, so very well. Uh, what I would like to do then at this point, because we have individuals who have been working through these issues in a variety of different ways, is turn to the members of our group who have already put a good deal of effort into helping to shape this particular session. And it seems only appropriate, Kim has gotten back to me and actually emailed me with some thoughts. So Kim, uh, this is your chance to highlight any of the issues which uh, both Laura and Heidi have done such a nice job of outlining uh, in the context of how CIDR has interacted with these projects or anything else that you think addresses the topic we were given. Thanks, Dick. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Here you're fine. Might speak up a bit. Okay. Um, I, I just had a couple of comments. I think um, my personal opinion is that, um, as Dick pointed out, the PGRN Seek project and the clinical validation has at Mayo forced some issues and really spurred a lot of work in the area of implementation. Um, and that's an area of, of heavy work going on at Hopkins as well. And I do believe projects like this, um, there's a huge amount of work to be done in the area of implementation, which has been discussed a lot this morning. Implementation is a very complicated process. And my personal opinion, although I obviously generate discovery data, um, um, as an outside uh, advisor here, not, not promoting my own work, um, would be that uh, an area for Emerge 3 to work, to continue to contribute to really would be more in the area of implementation of these types of clinical results than in discovery. But that's my personal opinion, but that's what I'm here for. I think that's pretty much all I had to say. And, and we wanted to give you that opportunity. Murray, uh, you've participated in these calls. Uh, comments from your perspective on the topics that we've been, been assigned. So, so um, one of the things that concerns me is that, um, you know, after it, it, it's specifically for PGX, but it could be for, for any kind of, of testing that we do. But one of the things that concerns me is, um, you know, we, we, we have developed this test, these tests. Um, information goes into the electronic health record along with clinical decision support. And uh, the, the, as we, as we uh, know, as we learn, um, the, the, the raw data or the, the, the data is, is sort of C attached or something in, in some kind of a, a other, other file. So, so uh, with, with large numbers of people going from you know, in, uh, having medical care at one institution and going to another institution. The issue of portability and standards and things like that, I, I think, uh, are also very important. And that with, uh, you know, since uh, eMERGE, we have uh, different electronic health systems and such, 
I think we're in a position to to actually uh, see what happens when when these things move when a patient say moves from one institution and healthcare organization to, to another. How do how do those reports <clears throat> travel with the patient? Let alone you know we we discussed about new information that pops up and how to how to generate that. What do you, what do you do just in a kind of a lateral move with just information? David, any comments that you want to make, and, and we'll have John next before we open this up to, to everyone who might have something to chip in. I don't know whether, da David, are you there? Maybe we'll move on to John. John? Well, both of them participated in the calls, and maybe we can go back then and ask anyone in the group to comment on either their experience because there are a large number of the eMERGE sites that have, have been vigorously participating in all of these projects and are facing the same problems. And we'll go back to our, to our chair to, to guide that discussion. Okay. Um, the floor is open for comments or questions uh, from any of the presenters, reactors, or summarizers. I mean, I think a concern that a lot of people have with returning results is the CLIA sample issue. When we face with, with the PGRN results that we want to return to that are CLIA certified, and many of our biorepository samples are not CLIA certified, um, some sites solve this by recollecting people. We solved it by doing the testing in our biorepository samples and recollecting the people who we want to return to. And I think if we're going to look at rare variants, it's not necessary to have you know, 50,000 CLIA appropriate samples because we're not going to return results to that many people. But we need to think about when we return results, how will we be returning CLIA results to those people if we're using biorepository <laughs> samples that aren't CLIA compliant? For so, so it sounds to me like that uh, was something just empirically sprang up, that some people made the decision to do it one way and some reflected and some just focused genotyping panels and some, you know, made their pipeline, their recent pipeline. And, and this seems to me it would be a wonderful focus of a paper on the alternative operational and cost implications of these various ways of taking a research result and making it clinically um, palatable, if you will. Uh, this is Larry Meyer. This reminds me of the old conundrum where a sample was collected for a rheumatological study and then you couldn't use it for a cancer study or it was collected for a germ study and you couldn't use it for something else. And now we're getting broad biobank approval to do lots of things. So when a study goes into such a biobank, um, it, it may be for a study of a rare variant um, and you can go back and collect that one, but that the, the great mass of those may eventually be used for pharmacogenomics. And then, then those are results which are clinically applicable to a, a substantial number of people. So I think genetics is uh, not unique, but has a, a very high density and a high probability of running tests in research labs, which could also be run in clinical labs. Um, and then as a, uh, we're all used to running things in non-CLIA approved labs and collecting our samples that way. Whereas in um, a, a cancer chemotherapy trial, you'd never think of, of grabbing a, you know, a, a serum sodium, if, if, you know, on your own and running it in your own lab. You just use the clinical lab. So to Hi, the Nick, this is David Carey. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, my, my audio wasn't working, so I, uh, <clears throat> came down the hall to Mark's office. Oh, you want to go to the so, Just to, so that as a group, if we can move in that direction in the future of collecting things that are, are CLIA approved, when they will have potential broad applicability a year from now or two years from now or five years from now, that will probably be a very good thing. Yeah, well, that was one of the points I was going to make because <clears throat> we have a lot of research samples but they're not suitable for clinical testing. And that was a bottleneck for this project. So one of the things that forced us to do was think about how to get around that. So one of the changes we're making is um, to convert our, our research biobank to CLIA so we don't have that issue in the future. And, there's, and the patients are consented for broad use, so I think it will give us a lot of mm -hmm. flexibility in terms of, of how we use those. The other challenge we had was we had to reevaluate our research consent because it did not, did not allow us to put data into patients' medical records. So we're, we've now changed our broad consent that gives us that, um, uh, that ability. The, the other, I, I think the beauty of this project was that it 
really has many moving parts that have to connect. Uh, and, and these are things that aren't usually connected in our health systems. And this, I think Dick used the word catalyst. I think we use this as a catalyst to drive some change here. I mentioned a few, uh, also some changes to the way we, we work with our, our molecular diagnostics lab um, and others. So, um, hey, David, I'm glad you made that point. I use the word catalyst, but in some ways this is a disruptive technology. It's not the business as usual. And certainly in a big place like ours or yours, we found that we had to adapt. And I think I'm just saying what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was a, it was, it's been an evolving process for our molecular diagnostics lab. Uh, they've been very supportive, but I think it is, it is a change in how they do business. This is Julie Johnson. So um, I think after this conversation, I'm a little confused. And, and I really beckon back to the original topic of balancing discovery versus implementation. Um, because to me, there was some implication that implementation meant that um, clinical results were being reported into the medical record, and yet it sounds like the, the very, very vast majority of, of genetic information generated in eMERGE is not, um, is not able to be placed into the medical record. So I, I and, and I'm, my, this might be sort of distractionary, but I guess I'm curious then where the implementation piece fits if the, um, if the results aren't clinical. So Julie, just to clarify, those of us that are returning results in the electronic health record, th those are all being returned under a clinical research protocol. They're not being uh, transitioned into a pure uh, clinical uh, result. So while they're in the EHR, uh, they are still a research result that is uh, where the patients are consented for return within the clinical setting and also consent to have that result placed in the EHR and to persist in the EHR. In a CLIA lab? Yes. <clears throat> but, and then clinical actions or decisions, changes in approaches or whatever can be made based on that? even though yes. they weren't generated in a clinical, in a CLIA environment? Well, well, the results are generated in a CLIA environment. I mean, that's the point that we're making. You can do a research study and clinically return results and use a CLIA-approved laboratory so you can actually use the results uh, clinically. So that, that's how we're actually doing it. And while we are uh, building uh, decision support around certain use cases, uh, particularly in the pharmacogenomics, it does not restrict clinicians from using the results uh, more broadly because they will be in the electronic health record and they, and they have been tested using uh, clinical uh, grade studies. It's Susan Wolf. So maybe I misunderstood Laura's presentation because it sounded like most of, most of the data were not being generated in a CLIA environment. Is that, is that not the case for like the PGRN-seq? The PGR and seq data is generally not being generated in a CLIA environment, but then they are validating certain genotypes in a CLIA environment for return in the EHR. So every single one of the participants is having some genotypes validated for return. But yes, the PGR and seq sequence data is generally not being generated in a CLIA environment. Is that helpful? But it could be. But it could be. But it could yeah. be. Yeah. And really at the Mayo Clinic, it's in our Department of Laboratory Medicine in a CLIA environment that the sequencing is being done. Could I make a comment? I don't know whether people can hear me. It's Susan Wolf at Minnesota. Yes. Um, a, a lot of these issues are also being encountered in the CSER studies, as probably some of you know, where some of the consent forms are actually asking uh, permission to incorporate even CLIA-generated research results into the EHR. So I think there's a consent issue that's emerging because of the consequences, the potential consequences of this information going into the EHR. Uh, so I think also looking at what's the consent format being used for moving that information would be very helpful. That's the next panel. Comment. Um, <clears throat> As I heard the discussion, and, and especially talking about gene insight, the integration of gene insight into uh, systems, into the EHR systems, one, one of the questions that, 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 that comes up is, 
sort of the who has responsibility for the decision support when uh, you know when the variant status changes. So one one approach is that the lab has responsibility. They figure out that there's this new variant, and then they they're trying to track all patients and tell patients. The other way to do it is to say there's a way of sharing knowledge about the new variant, and the EHR system uses its own infrastructure and decision support to do that. And and we see a conflict in that. And actually, we'd prefer not to have the lab do it because what happens then is you start exposing different ways of doing decision, lo you know, decision logic is dependent on each individual system that's generating that knowledge and it, it, it's kind of just a system architecture question, but uh, I, I don't know what experience people have had and whether you have the same feeling or it's fine with you if the lab does it and then you figure out some unique way to, you know, do genetic results different than you do all kinds of other decision support in the system. So this is Heidi. I can, I can expand a little bit on how we've implemented that. So the alerts that we send go directly to the physician, and then it is the physician that is responsible for relaying that information to the patient if they feel it's appropriate. In addition, that because all the genetic data is structured, the EHR environment itself, with you know, approval from the makers of it, can implement additional clinical support rules on top of the structured data. So, you know, it is integrated and it's the physician's responsibility to return that data. We do allow them to either sign up for proactive alerts or they can simply only get the information when they go into a patient's medical record because they're seeing the patient the next time. Is that consistent with other environments in the EHR for that type of information? How does the notification to the physician happen? Is it happening through the common mechanism of the EHR, or are you just sending an email, or how, how um, it, does that actually happen? It is being generated by the Gene Insight software system, um, which is fully integrated into the EHR. Now, it isn't, it isn't a part of the main EHR system, and actually when we implement EPIC, There'll be uh, just an interface between the two. It'll be a single sign-on, but uh, it is a separate software system that's generating those alerts that then get emailed to the physician. Dan's point was not that initial analysis, but what happens three years down the road when you discover that somebody is a star? We've never seen that before, but now we know what it means, and so our clinical interpretation of the genotype changes three years after you did the original analysis. Who owns that re-notification? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. And one of the ways we've set it up is that the, the clinic sites have a system for the whole clinic. And that way, if care changes from physician to physician, from the you know, original ordering resident, let's say, to a, a physician later, that, that that clinic is getting the information and they often designate a genetic counselor who sort of manages it. We have talked about um, you know, trying to manage who's responsible for what within the EHR environment, although it gets a little complex. Uh, and we also have a, a new study that we're um, starting to look at to potentially allow patients to know when alerts are sent on their genetic information so that they, if there's no physician any longer, the, or the original ordering physician is no longer caring for them, that they can um, find another physician to manage that, that result change because these things do happen years later and they already have. Um, so that is something that we continue to try to explore how best to support. Um, this is Mark. Justin, there's uh, no established standard of care more broadly about who owns that process. That would be a potential uh, thing that could be included as a study question for an RFA, which is to study both the process of how reannotation would take place, but also to study uh, the ELSI-related issues uh, relating to reannotation and update. It seems to me there's a precedent here for the interpretation of microbiology results, which on a shorter time frame uh, often change. They'll be preliminary and then they'll be revised. Sometimes the revisions replace the initial 
uh, interpretation in such a way that the clinical implications are quite different. And uh, so it isn't, it seems to me, territory that genomics has to make up or en envision as never having occurred before in clinical environments. Uh, Susan speaking. I think, though, to support the prior comment, there remains an enormous ethical and legal controversy about responsibility for recontact and updating. So I would support the idea that it really needs further work. Yeah, and Dan, I think the other difference is, is that in the microbiologic example, and, and this is also true in, in pathology, um, that you can really fairly cleanly define an episode of care uh, associated around those things that does have a relatively delimited time frame, uh, whereas those things are less clearly defined at the present time in the genomics. So I think, again, whether this is a place where genetics exceptionalism is really relevant or not, I don't know. And part of the analysis would be to say, how is, how is this the same or different from those examples? But uh, it is not something that, the, that there's clear consensus on. I think the other thing with microbiology is, you know, I know that we've had to implement special decision report rules for TB cultures because by the time they come back, their page is off the screen and people miss them. And you know with micro, it grows in a certain amount of time or you're done. You don't have the case of the bottle grew three years late. So you, you have a, a truncating function there. Sure. Okay, well that, that's been an excellent discussion and uh, so what we'll do... Is there anything else? Uh, if, are there any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, so we'll segue from testing to informed consent to education and governance and our presenter is in the room here in uh, sunny Bethesda. It's blue on the top and white on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs>